This week's The Gwent Report on an upbeat note with Carrie Underwood. Uh, my name is Nicholas Webb. Today I am joined in the studio by Mark Reckless, AM, uh, the Assembly Member for South Wales East. Hello, Mark. Hello. Now, you've dedicated much of your political career to the cause of pulling Britain out of the European Union. Um, on leaving UKIP, and we'll discuss your political career in a little bit, um, you said it had achieved its aim. Looking at where we currently are with the Brexit negotiations, do you still feel the aim has been achieved? Well, it's a fast-moving uh, situation. I, I, I hope so. I uh, believe so. And on March 29th uh, next year, we should be uh, leaving the European Union. It's not exactly what the relationship is with the European Union or what trade deal or otherwise they want to uh, uh, agree to. It's a matter for them as well as us, but we didn't vote to leave the EU if the EU gave us a particular type of deal. We voted to leave the EU and make our own decisions about our about our future, and I, I think that's what we're going to do. It was very much an, an open-ended um, situation beyond the vote, wasn't it? There wasn't really a plan in place as to what Brexit would look like, but you you, you have confidence in the direction we're we're moving. But for there to be a plan in, 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 in place, um, you know, countries aren't planned, democracies aren't planned, people take their own d decisions and uh, as a democracy and as a nation together, as a United Kingdom, we, we decide what our future is going to, 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 to be. And you know, the customs union, the, the, the single market, they are you know, the essence of what the European Union is about. We uh, voted to leave. There was certainly no discussion of staying in the, the customs union and uh, I felt the vote leave campaign was very clear we'd be leaving the single market as as well and people who raise this issue I think are disproportionately remainers who talk about a sort of soft Brexit or a cliff edge or whatever. There is simply Brexit leaving the European Union and deciding our own future and people who don't uh, agree with that and some but not all people who voted remain are, are trying to undermine that and would prefer us to to, to stay and that's why why we hear these terms we need to, to just get on with leaving and uh, become an independent country outside the European Union. You can understand why a lot of the electorate are tuning out a little bit when it comes to discussions of Canada plus, Norway minus, EFTA, EEA, soft Brexit, hard Brexit, red, white and blue Brexit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was a green Brexit at one point wasn't there? Didn't Michael Gove propose a green Brexit? <laughs> um, it, it's driving a an increased division amongst the or between the sort of political discussion and an electorate and if we look at the largely Brexit voting electorate, you, you regularly hear the, the terminology we just want them to get on with it mm. without of course defining what it is. Do you feel that the politicians are doing enough to explain it um, in terms that the electorate can see is enacting their decision from the 23rd of June 2016? I mean, I feel I've, I've just done so. I mean, it is leaving the European Union, being a self-governing democracy and taking our own decisions. I mean, the issues of you know, precisely what the trade deal is with the European uh, Union and details of the future relationship with the European Union is a, a secondary matter to being an independent country, taking our own decisions now i would you know, like us to have a free trade deal with the european um union but unfortunately since our, our vote the, the european union i think on, on one thing is you know, sensibly said that you, you you can't cherry pick and either you're in the single market or you're out and i, I think that's understandable but what, what they haven't done is treat us as generously as any other sort of third country whereas actually our relations and history with the european union is much much closer and people talk about a, a Canada style free trade deal and that would be a, a sensible way forward for the United Kingdom. Unfortunately the European Union at least uh, so far hasn't been offering that and is saying we'll only give you that if you give us Northern Ireland, if you, if you allow Northern Ireland to be part of our customs union, to be part of our regulatory system and not for the people of Northern Ireland or the people of the United Kingdom to decide but for the European Union to in many ways govern uh, the Northern Ireland as it 
sees fit. Now, I don't think that's a reasonable thing to ask of this country. And the reason negotiations have been difficult and we haven't yet come to a sensible agreement is because of the European Union, in effect, seeking to annex Northern Ireland. That is unacceptable. We would like a friendly relationship with them and the sort of free trade deal they have with Canada. But that has to be subject to their respecting our territorial integrity as a United Kingdom. I've mentioned that uh, um, the desire for Brexit has been something that has run throughout your political career, indeed, long before the word Brexit existed. <laughs> um, just, just to give a, a little bit of background for the listeners, um, you were educated at, at Marlborough College in Christchurch, Oxford, um, went to Columbia Business School, worked as a strategist for a financial services company. I've been reading your Wikipedia page, haven't I? Let's be honest. <laughs> um, you then worked in the Conservative Central Office Policy Unit, um, and that was during William Hague's leadership, was it? Uh, Ian Duncan Smith. Ian Duncan Smith's leadership. And then Michael Howard. And Michael Howard. Um, uh, and you were also a barrister. There will be some people who are listening thinking this does hit a few of the stereotypes for, a, for an MP, particularly a, a Tory MP. Um, when, when did the ambition to enter Parliament first cross your mind? Uh, this may, may add to the, the unpopular professions or stereotypes that you uh, set out, but as, as far ago as I remember, actually, probably since I was uh, perhaps about five, 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 five or six years old. Oh, crikey, <laughs> that, that, that is a life in politics, isn't it? Um, and uh, not necessarily when you were five or six, admittedly, but, but what sort of policy areas um, were particularly motivating your interest to get involved in, in politics? Uh, to, to be fair, I mean, I think that, that sort of age, it was just a, a very sort of background, uh, a background thought and sort of interest in, in sort of who, who, who decides and uh, who exercises power and make, makes decisions in the world uh, around you. And I, I didn't obsess about politics for, for much of my um, childhood. Um, but... I, I suppose it was really when I was about 17 or 18 and um, watching what happened to the economy as we uh, uh, shadowed the Deutsche Mark and then later joined the uh, uh, European exchange rate mechanism. I was you know, studying uh, economics and thinking about sort of politics at, at, at university, but also at, at school beforehand, just when I was first thinking about these things, I thought that it all looked a bit too good to be true and they got some sort of cutting interest rates and stoking up the economy further. And then, then I found out that I was right in that assessment. And then I felt that the country got completely the wrong lesson and then did the complete opposite by making a recession worse and worse by putting interest rates up very, very high. And that was a disaster. And it came of trying to run the British economy uh, as if it was part of a, a central European uh, economy. And... I felt that was a, a disaster and that we'd be much better off making our own decisions uh, as, as, as a country. And I, I think that cemented particularly my, my interest in politics. And it was fr fr from that and a, a, a belief that economically we would be uh, better off outside uh, the European Union. And while waiting for that, sort of resisting its uh, monetary integration and the euro that I, I suppose most prompted my interest in, 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 in politics and doing everything I could to, to, to try and get us out of the European Union. You contested the, uh, well, the Medway constituency, the precursor to Rochester and Strood um, in 2000 and 2005 um, against, and I, I must make mention of this, against Bob Marshall Andrews, who I believe, like you, moved to Wales afterwards. I believe he moved to Pembrokeshire. Um, and um, it does. He is responsible for um, one of the more amusing moments in in politics as I followed it, which is when in two thousand and five he went on something of a rant and blamed his defeat, which it later turned out hadn't occurred, um, on Tony Blair and promptly called for his resignation while the votes were still being counted. <laughs> and I think that's got to count as a, a slightly unfortunate judgment call. Not that he would be too concerned. He was certainly no Blairite. Um, there, there then seemed to be. Well, a, a number of issues was the quote that came from Rochester and Strood um, Conservative Association about the selection procedure for the 2010 election, which did eventually select you. But, I mean, we've heard stories from, um, from others that the 2010 election, there was a lot of input from the centre. Um, the story that, that came out that Annunciata Rees-Mogg was suggested she could be called Nancy Mogg because it would work better for the electorate. Did you feel there were efforts to prevent you being a candidate in, in 2010? Yes, very, very, very much so. But once I, I, I was selected as the candidate, they, they largely left me uh, alone after that. And uh, 
and gave up, which was uh, <laughs> welcome in, in that in that in that sense. You you mentioned Bob Marshall Marshall Andrews and his uh, his overnight sort of speech before in two thousand and five, uh, and I'm not sure it was a misjudgment. I, I thought actually in media terms he managed to dominate the overnight uh, sort of media analysis with what he wanted to say and he he never quite found his voice in that camp because he wasn't quite sure if he was campaigning against me or campaigning against Blair but at that point he succeeded in uh in, in hitting out at both of us and you know for a while I thought I'd won and then found in the early hours of the the morning that I hadn't and uh he staged what what what, what he calls a Lazarus-like recovery and I call uh, an Al Gore style retraction <laughs> he had one but it was it was very close I and mean, i called a recount I, I lost i think by 188 initially mm. but it went up to 213 after the recount um for 2010 now i think partly because there'd been quite a there was quite a strong swing t- towards the conservatives in kent and essex and that part of the country and you know, more so in, in roxton street than almost any, anywhere else i like to think in part due to the the, the the ground work and the campaign i'd been doing since 2001 as the candidate and i think for 2010 all I really needed to do was to get reselected as a candidate by the association and to get there, basically not have the centre veto my being able to be considered by them. And having got over that hurdle, uh, I was able to get reselected and I think won by, by nearly 10,000 in, in, in 2010 on the basis of what was a very strong national swing, but also a strong regional swing as well. Whereas I think if I'd won in 2005, it would have been much more to, due to my own efforts and the campaign and the, the, the work I'd, I'd put in prior to, prior to that. As a Conservative MP, um, you did gain a bit of a reputation for being a rebel. Um, and rebels seem to come in in different varieties. There are some who seem to relish being rebels. There are others who perhaps have an axe to grind, having maybe been removed from government at some stage. Um, why did you find yourself in such regular disagreement with David Cameron's government? Well, because I, I came into politics to... Uh, leave the European Union that's always been my uh, ambition and shortly after being elected I I found I was uh, expected according at least to the the Conservative whip to vote for the establishment of the European External Action Service or any new foreign office or diplomatic service and I'd understood the Conservative policy was against this and we didn't want the the Lisbon Treaty and the the, the setting up of these bodies that came from it so I was amazed when I found that there was a three-line whip that we should vote for the establishment of this and I explained to my whip that I was against it and would be voting against and he was a little angry to start with and tried various things to persuade me and then very generously said I, I could go home and I, I didn't have to vote at all. I said, well, I'm, I'm opposed <laughs> to, to, to this. And I insisted on, on voting against because it was wrong. Uh, it wasn't a major issue. Uh, a lot of people thought it was a done deal. And uh, there's only, I think, 13 of us in the no lobby uh, voting against us. But, okay, th- this, but, but one of those people was, was Jeremy Corbyn. It was the first time I, I, I met him. And I had a very, very interesting chat with him in the, uh, in the no lobby <laughs> opposing the external action service for the... Uh, EU, but but at every stage, I mean, I've you know tried to forward and develop the argument for for getting out of the European Union. The Liberal Democrats, who we entered coalition with in 2010, they had campaigned previously for what they said a, was a real referendum on on Europe. They didn't want a re- referendum on the Lisbon Treaty anymore because they feared they you know, would lose it. Um, so they found a way of climbing down from that and saying actually what they want instead was a referendum on membership of the European Union. This was when Ed Davey got kicked out of the Commons. That's for, right. For, <laughs> that's right. So, I, I, so when I saw there was a hung parliament, you know, the, 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 uh, my my sort of demand, so to speak, and some some, some others were, was that we should hold the Liberal Democrats to what they they promised, and as that's what they they called for, then the Conservatives we should agree with them in the coalition agreement that we would pursue that, and we had that in our referendum. Unfortunately, David Cameron and others didn't agree with me, and that they didn't make that part of the agreement. Uh, and still worse, the agreement was just agreed by, I think, George Osborne and David Cameron without any reference to the parliamentary party, whereas the Liberal Democrats were allowed to vote on it, not just the parliamentary party, but then the party as a whole in a special conference where it was just imposed on backbench Conservative MPs when we hadn't agreed to it. So I think that's another reason why there was quite a lot of rebellions, and as you put it, and I was quite quite happy to be voting and, and standing on the manifesto we were elected on for our beliefs as as conservatives um rather than a coalition agreement that had been cooked up in sort of closed rooms without any reference to the parliamentary party that was then expected to, to put it into 
into place. I feel the happy story of how you got to meet Jeremy Corbyn in the voting lobby is a good moment to take a, a little bit of a break from the politics and play some music. Um, the first track you've selected is by The Cure. Uh, what, what was your reason for suggesting this song? Because we, we, sorry, I should say, we um, invite our guests to, to select um, some of the music we play during each interview. So, uh, Mark, why did you select The Cure? I think The Cure were the, the first uh, band I saw live in, in concert, and uh, I followed them uh, quite, quite, quite closely while I was uh, in my latter days as a, as a schoolboy. And uh, in, in particular, I used to model my hairstyle on that of uh, Robert Smith, their lead singer, I think. I think hailed from Crawley and I had very long hair at that time and I used to uh, crimp it and uh, used to sort of st 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 stand out at least a, at least a foot into the into the air in a style that was more similar to Robert Smith the cure than than anyone else I was very surprised I was allowed to get away with it in our school photo um, and I think in between days that we're uh, I think about to play is I think w w w one of my uh, one of my favorite of, of the cure repertoire And that was The Cure, selected by Mark Reckless. Now, we mentioned that your political career has been more interesting than, than some can account for over the last decade. Um, on Saturday, the 27th of September 2014, you walked on stage at the UKIP conference in Doncaster to announce your defection. Now, I am one of those people who wants my politicians to get on with policy, but I cannot deny that I enjoy a bit of theatre in politics as well. And you might not appreciate me doing this, but I have to say to those listeners who are um, uh, followers of, of that element of politics, I watched back the, U clip, uh, the YouTube clip of this um, and Nigel Farage teases it. You get a near rock star response as you walk out. Um, you get a standing ovation. You've got the crowd chanting UKIP. That must have been quite an experience when your previous experience has been as a backbench MP. It was quite a shock, really. Um, I suppose it was a culmination of what much of what I'd done as a backbench M M MP. I referred to my first so-called rebellion, but we then had more and more votes, and, and ultimately I, I sort of won a vote on my motion to cut the European Union budget, and that was with 53 Conservatives and the whole Labour Party as, as well, which I'd negotiated. And I think it was the week following that uh, defeat that David Cameron told Angela Merkel for the first time that he was going to have to have an in-out referendum so I think actually in terms of what I've done I feel that was as significant as what I've done that you just referred to in September 2014 but stepping onto that 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 stage she was quite a surprise to me I hadn't quite sort of thought about it I mean that aspect hadn't really been in my mind at all I'd seen it was obviously a very 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 tense and quite difficult um, sort of time and I was quite focused on just sort of getting through it um, and this sort of rock star sort of welcome and the type of response, I hadn't sort of thought about that at all. And in some ways, I, I just, the first thought that went through my mind is, oh, well, is this just what sort of UKIP's like? I, I hadn't sort of thought it was particular to the circumstances of how and when I, I walked onto the stage, which you know, clearly clearly it was, but, but that wasn't sort of my mind. It was actually just quite difficult to get through the speech because everyone just kept on standing up and uh, applauding uh, so 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 frequently and it, it was hard to say more than a sentence at a time and I think the speech probably took about twice as long as I did, ex expected it to when uh, preparing and um, yeah it was sort of quite striking but I, I it was more putting my head down and sort of getting getting through it perhaps than enjoying the the the, the moment or in any sense, sort of wanting that type of re 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 reception. I mean, I think some people in, in politics, I think that sort of approbation and, and sort of people welcoming what you do and uh, applauding you and being on TV or, or radio, it, it, it's a lot of what it's about. And I think it's very important for, for quite a number of politicians. I, I'm not averse to it, but it's not something I particularly seek either. And it was something I, I sort of had to negotiate and... And, and, and get through. Mm. To, to, to look at the context of this, I mean, your defection came shortly after Douglas Carswell um, left the Conservatives for UKIP. And at the time, I mean, there were 
numerous stories circulating in the press, um, suggestions of around seven um, Conservative MPs being approached by UKIP. Um, I'll, I'll come to the, the exact timing issue, but a week later, or under a week later, actually, um, the press pack gathered in Aaron Banks's sizable back garden um, with expectation that there could be another defection, um, the full story of which perhaps has, has never quite come out. But um, there was clearly a great deal of concern. So I appreciate you're probably, I, I wish you would, but I appreciate you're probably not going to give away private conversations. But broadly speaking, how did the defection come about? Who approached who? Well, I was um, in conversation with Douglas, who's a close, close friend for, for quite a while uh, beforehand. And it was the, the, the circumstances of wanting to, to get us out of the European Union. And I, I feel in terms of winning the votes and getting the, at least in principle, referendum commitment that we, we got, that we were not going to go any, any further within the Conservative Party in pressing those issues and what we got during that period after my defection and during the Robstrand Street by-election was a commitment from David Cameron that he would not be Prime Minister again unless he could get uh, a referendum agreed and that he would bring forward legislation for that referendum in the first 100 uh, days and I think what Douglas and I did then made it far harder for the Conservative Party and David Cameron to get out of that commitment to a referendum. And we see now how much many of the Remainers want to get out of the vote that was made. And I think there would have been a lot of efforts from the top of the Conservative Party uh, to do that if their feet hadn't been held to the fire in the way that Douglas and I did during that uh, period. Um, I also think that in, in that febrile atmosphere that you describe, I think David Cameron and his team made misjudgments. And in particular, they made promises on immigration to try and win the Robster and Street by-election that they couldn't keep. And it was that commitment to put a cap on EU uh, migration that he gave at that time, which I think set up his renegotiation for a failure. And rather than being able to show he'd negotiated some sort of third way or got some sort of different relationship, all he was seen as having done was failed to keep the promises that he had made. And ultimately, those promises were made to try and win the Robster and Strood by election and to try and forestall further uh, defections. And I think it was those promises that came back to, 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 to bite him later and set up his renegotiation as a failure. Your defection took place on the Saturday. On the Sunday immediately after it was the start of the Conservative Party conference in Birmingham. Um, you'd been expected to be at that event, um, and it was perceived that the announcement at the UKIP conference was timed to cause maximum damage to the Conservatives and David Cameron's mm -hmm. government. Can you understand the anger felt then, um, and which is still apparent from the controversy over your return to broadly conservative politics, we'll get to that in due course, um, that there's still an anger that exists with some senior conservatives. I, I, I can, um, but I also feel it is a little self-referential because when I made this announcement, it wasn't because it was the day before the Conservative conference, it was because it was the UKIP conference. And that sort of perspective seems to be, be lost by mm, some people within the Conservative Party whose focus is simply on the timing of when the Conservative uh, conference uh, was. And, you know, I mean, what, what, if one what makes a change like, like that, clearly, clearly there will be people who are upset. On the other hand, there are people I've you know, remained friends with and, and close to within the the Conservative Party, and there are people within the Conservative Party who've come up to me since, some soon after, some quite a long time after, and said that they feel that what I did made a, a difference to to the referendum and to our leaving the European Union, and it's it's that that I was trying to achieve. So to the extent that that people were were hurt and disappointed by my actions, I'm I, I'm sorry that they they are. But for me, it's always been about trying to get my country out of the European Union 
rather than the the, 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 the specifics of where one is within a, a party and those relationships. You've actually touched on something I was going to come to later on, so I'm going to jump slightly out of the, the chronology for a moment. Um, I mean, you mentioned there that it has uh, your political career, the, the political journey, if you will, um, has um, impacted on, on friendships. I mean, to what extent has it impacted on, on friendships and, and family life for you? Because at the end of the day, we, we're, it's very easy for us to see our politicians purely as their job. And clearly, nobody is just their job. Um, I mean, it impacted uh, a lot on um, family family life. Um, yeah, in the long term, we've moved from Kent to to, to, to Wales. Oh, we'll get to that. Um, but in the near term, it was it was very difficult. I mean, it was the extent to which the media descended on Rochester and the level of pressures on me and my my family were were very intense. And the chairman of the local conservatives said he wanted me to sort of drive me off Rochester High Street and to ensure that I was, you know, unwelcome. And I'm not sure whether he used the phrase subject to direct action in the way John McDonnell for, for Labour, Labour did. But it was, it was quite nasty. And there were sort of, um, I think that the local sort of regional news was in investigating this and just some of those personal uh, aspects in the sense of threat. And for a while, my... Uh, my family were went away to what I described as an undisclosed uh, location, and it was you know a week or two before they they came back, or we felt comfortable having our, our, our children in, in, in nursery and just sort of organising our lives locally again. I think one thing that made it a bit easy was I was always available to the media, so I didn't really get sort of doorstep to have the media come into my my, my house, and uh, we also had people next door and your neighbours who were very supportive and and helpful. So in, in that sense, that helped in getting through it. But the level of a uh, attention uh was out of you know all, all, all scale in terms of magnitude compared to what i'd been used to even as a, a relatively high profile backbencher mm -hmm. i think it's a family link that leads us to play you two next isn't it yes um i mean i, I listened to, to to you two as much probably as any other band uh, when i was at school and a fair, fair amount uh since but um their sort of irish uh, uh irish heritage is also uh uh, shared with me my uh my mother is from ireland sort of came over i think when she was 17 years old and trained as a as a nurse and met my father he's uh he's a doctor and uh, her father my, my grandfather was uh, a td an irish uh, mp for, for donegal east in the late 30s early part of the second world war so uh, that's uh parts of my heritage uh, uh, as, uh, as well and frankly i just think this is uh, uh, an excellent song pride in the name of love <laughs> You've made reference to the by-election of 2014 in which you were elected and you served as um, UKIP MP for Rochester and Strood until the 2015 general election. And following that, you relocated to Wales. Um, had you not done so, you wouldn't be on this radio station right now, let's be fair. <laughs> um, was that purely a decision based on the opportunity of being in elected office again? Um, I, I think it was a, a mixed set of uh, re reasons. Um, I think first we uh, had a year or so to go until there was a, a, a referendum on our membership of the European Union and campaigning a, around and, and, and for that referendum was a sort of key priority of, of, of mine. So you know, to the extent I was you know, gone back to the city or you know, got another job as a, a lawyer or something like that, it'd been much harder to have a, an impact on that uh, Debate. So I, I took up a, a position as uh, UKIP's uh, head of policy, and um, we had a number of elections coming up. But I was asked by the party to make my sort of top priority uh, in terms of my time and commitment um, preparing the, the UKIP manifesto for the Welsh Assembly uh, election. So I, I started working quite hard on, on that and, and coming to Wales. Uh, Fair, fair amount for that and staying at a hotel hotels quite a lot the Cardiff North Premier Inn became quite a quite a quite a regular but uh, it made, made sense to, 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 to sort of get a, get, get a house and come back and, 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 and forth and the more I did in terms of uh, meeting people around uh, Wales and different groups and uh, thinking about the, the, the politics I, I thought actually you know why, why don't I get more involved and sort of put myself 
forward as a as a candidate for the sort of campaign. So that's what I uh, what, what I what I did. I think it was a, a huge opportunity for for UKIP at the time. Unfortunately, it's not an opportunity that UKIP took full advantage um, of. But uh, as well as um, some strong people from across Wales who'd been you know, grassroots members for a long time. I think it was felt there there was there was a need also for for for, for, for some people with uh, elected uh, experience to give a, a greater balance to, to the group and um, discussed it with my, my my wife and wider wider family and uh, we we decided that actually uh, moving to to South East Wales would be something that would be be good for us as a, a, a as a family um, there's a, a lot more a lot more room a lot more. A lot more greenery, and uh, in some ways, li- 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 life here I find find very very enjoyable. It's uh, close to my parents who are uh, in their seventies now, and uh, in Somerset, and uh, it's very very nice to see then see more of the the grandkids. And I think over the past few years, we've uh, beginning to put down roots uh, roots here, and uh, pleased pleased we made that choice. Before you came to Wales, my only awareness of Mark Reckless was the defection, the by-election, as somebody who was a rebel in the awkward squad, as it sometimes got referred to. When I watched your performances in the Senna's, and I appreciate it, Senna's TV probably doesn't get the best ratings. I might not be... I might not be in a position to argue, depending on how well this radio show goes, but um, it probably doesn't get the best ratings. But I do keep quite a close eye on what happens in the Senate. And to me, the Mark Reckless I saw in that environment was completely different to the stereotype that I, or the image that I had built up on the basis of my knowledge um, of you to that point. Um, How do you view the way in which the assembly operates in contrast to how parliament does because obviously we do have a, a few former mps who've served in the assembly but it's it's not a regular occurrence and they they work in quite different ways how have you found um those changes and and, and what does the what does the assembly do better what does parliament do better i, I think the difference is probably less great than your comparison of perhaps uh, the more well-known and perhaps stereotypical moments of my parliamentary career uh, would be by comparison. Because I think a lot of what I did as the MP for Rochester and, 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 and Strood as a member of the Home Affairs uh, Select Committee, where we did some very high, high profile, but actually you know, quite quite thoughtful and quite a lot of detailed work I was in, involved with, with uh, policing and some particular scalps of uh, individuals who came for our committee and then quickly, quickly resigned. Uh, that sort of helped fend off the idea of a an estuary airport, sort of Boris Island, a sort of twice the size of uh, Heathrow that he wants to build in the constituency I represented in, 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 in Kent, uh, and also a lot of sort of economic issues I was closely involved with um, there, perhaps you know, got, got less national n- coverage of what I was, was doing, but were equally important to my parliamentary uh, work. And a lot of what I do in the, the, the Assembly is like that as well. I mean, I, I cha- chaired the, the Climate Change and Environment Rural Affairs Committee for a while, and in particular the agricultural post-Brexit policies we were pushing forward. I think Michael Gove has taken up quite a lot of that on a, a UK-wide basis uh, now. Um, I've been on the Education Committee, now on the uh, Brexit Committee. And yes, uh, the Chamber is more consensual. Um, the differences are... Are, 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 are less across politics, perhaps a bit greater than they were thanks to, to UKIP being there, but I think still less perhaps than the more ideological and partisan split between a Conservative Party and an increasingly left-wing Labour Party at uh, Westminster. But I think there are also similarities. It's a smaller it's a smaller institution, but there's also cooperation and com- committee work and focus on quite technical issues at Westminster as well. It's just perhaps one sees less of that refracted uh, through the media and the assembly may lack some of those set piece uh, occasions, although we, we do our best in first minister questions to, to hold Carwin and his uh, successor uh, uh, as, as much as we, 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 we can. Uh, how do you feel in terms of status um, th- the difference exists? Because clearly it's been, I mean, I, I don't mean this as a criticism of the assembly, it's difficult for a still relatively young institution teenage institution as it is these days um to have quite the same 
um, weight as um, an incredibly historic parliamentary system. And yet it is making, well, the Welsh Government and scrutinised by the Assembly are making huge decisions on health, education, many of the issues that affect people in a in a day-to-day way, but doesn't seem to garner the same level of attention. I mean, from your point of view, having served in both, has it felt like a change in status? Uh, no, it, it hasn't especially. Um, I, I suppose there's been quite, an, uh, quite, quite a tra- trajectory to my political career that we've uh, d- discussed in terms of the level of, of coverage, because it's no, not really a about that for me it hasn't particularly impact on how I've you know, seen seen myself through that but I think in terms of the assembly um, I think for Plaid Cymru actually the assembly has always had higher status than Westminster and I think the Conservative Party is probably the opposite and the, the traffic has really been one way from the assembly to Westminster but I think for Labour, it was quite interesting to uh, see Hugh Aranka Davis uh, coming from Westminster to the uh, Assembly and sort of Julie Morgan, uh, uh, of course. And I think having some two way traffic for Labour, I think that has made the status of the two institutions more equal than it was. And I think one of the challenges and potentially difficulties that the Conservative group has in the uh, Welsh Assembly is the, the sort of perception that for many in the party, sort of Westminster matters more. Actually, people who remain opposed to sort of devolution, you know, it's dif- disproportionately represented in Conservative circles. And I, I think that, that gives a particular challenge for the Conservative Party in its relation with the uh, Welsh Assembly. But I think overall, the status has become more equal. And because Labour are in power in Wales, but not in Westminster, and we've seen Labour, M- Labour MPs come to the Assembly as well as vice versa, I think that has helped make the uh, the, the status, which you know, matters for, for many politicians, more equal uh, than was the case before. A couple more questions about your time in UKIP before we, we move on to your return to Conservative politics. Um, you worked in the policy unit um, with the Conservatives, as, as was mentioned. You became an MP. Um, one would imagine there is a significant change in terms of professionalism resources available between the way that the conservative machine worked and the way a UKIP machine which appears quite haphazard at times but almost seems to revel in its haphazardness um, that must have been quite a uh, quite a difference to experience from the way in which the conservatives operated to the way UKIP did in some ways yes um, the conservative um party has systems and has uh, a bureaucracy and has sort of ways of doing things but often those are are broken frankly and uh, the way people were sometimes treated within UKIP the way the rule book was um, unevenly uh, uh, applied the way candidate selections were run actually there's quite a lot in common with how the Conservative Party has done uh, uh, parliament, parliamentary and other and other selections so I would also say that in the period when I was sort of working for the party but ceased being an MP, um, the, the difference in resources wasn't, wasn't that clear because in two different ways you could were treated quite, quite generously. There were two different grants. One was a policy development grant and depended on having had two MPs at a particular point in the previous year. And thanks to my by-election victory, there was this quite substantial you know, six-figure sum of, of money that was available for policy development uh, and I was in, in charge of spending it and, importantly, a- accounting for it and make sure it was spent properly and seen to be spent properly. So I was able to have a sort of ring-fenced grant that had paid for, for some of that policy development uh, work. And I, I felt that the manifesto that UKIP put forward in, in Wales was a, a, a pro- professional and, and quite impressively developed document compared to anything that had gone before for UKIP, except the 2015 uh, manifesto, which was also a, a good document. We then also had a, a period when there was a very generous amount of short money financing that I was also in, in charge of overseeing for Douglas Carswell, although we only sp- spent a, a modest proportion of that. Again, it was uh, quite a lot of money, and uh, it was very important to make sure it was spent properly. Following that Welsh UKIP manifesto, um, things changed fairly rapidly um, in the yes. grouping. Mm-hmm. Um, and to date, UKIP has had a 
fairly chaotic existence, I think it's fair to say, in the Assembly. In fact, I think it's now had more leaders than it's had non-leaders, which takes some doing. <laughs> when it came to your decision to leave, and I know that you've noted that you felt it was job done in terms of, of the referendum, was it also a relief to leave that UKIP group? Yes, I think is the uh, is the answer. I think that the relief sort of perhaps came up sort of gradually, which is why I, I, I sort of hes- hesitated to to answer. But I, I felt at that time it, it was job done, and there was uh, an election shortly afterwards on the basis of a Conservative manifesto and a very clear position from Theresa May that we would be leaving the single market, we would be leaving the customs union, and we would be leaving the jurisdiction of the European. Court of Justice, and I think given the Conservative Party was choosing to to fight on that basis, it was important I should identify myself uh, with that, and I, I hope that vision still comes to pass. On leaving UKIP in the Welsh Assembly, you came to an agreement with the then Welsh Conservative leader Andrew R.T. Davis to be part of the Conservative group in the Assembly, um, but you were not... Um, you might be able to fill in the blanks on this, allowed to, invited to, um, rejoin the party, um, which I'm, I'm sure to some listeners will be a, a fairly um, confusing situation, <laughs> as it might be to you. Um, that stemmed from your return to the Conservative fold not being popular with some Tory MPs, seemingly including the Secretary of State for Wales, can you understand their objections and what would your message be to those who were concerned about your return to Conservative politics? I mean, firstly, that the you know, the Conservative group in the National Assembly for Wales determines its own membership and whip. And I, I think that's important for any group in a, a parliamentary uh, setting. So... Yes, I had discussions with Andrew R.T. Davis, but I had at least as many discussions before the decision with Paul Davis. And it was then a decision of the Conservative group as a, a whole. And it's right that that decision should be taken by the Conservative group rather than that group remotely directed from from Westminster. And I think this goes to some of the issues the Conservative Party has as to whether there is a group in the Welsh Assembly that is aspiring to to govern or at least be part of a government in Wales and is setting policy to benefit from the evolved settlement and exploit the opportunities that offers to the greatest possible extent, or whether it is a group that is simply there to do the the bidding of Westminster, be that the the, the Secretary of State or the MPs or the party leadership as a as a whole, and you know, the, the Conservative group has to define itself on that. Uh, that key access, and I think the decision, in, in my regard, was 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 probably part of, of of that. Has any effort been made, either by yourself or by um, those senior conservatives, whether they be within the party infrastructure or whether they be MPs, to to meet and discuss, to to try and find a way forward? Well, I mean, always, always happy to, 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 to meet and uh, discuss with with people. I mean, I think there have been some important. Uh, other priorities <laughs> there was uh, an election that came quite uh, quickly on that so there were some uh, discussions uh, 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 around that and uh, it was a role I, 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 I play, played within the, the, the campaign um, but Brexit is also is also there and I, I don't think it's just a you know, matter of me I think the issue of Brexit is you know, dividing People I feared too much within the Conservative Party. I, I hope if we were to move away from the Chequers uh, approach and look to promote a, a trade deal uh, uh, on a Canada basis, if the EU uh, uh, allows that, that would be a, a, a much better place for the party to, to be. And I think to some extent I've been sort of caught up in that. But also I you know, entirely understand uh, people who, who feel I shouldn't have done as I, I did in the past who assess things in a different way than I do and all I can say is everything I've done is to to try and get us out of the European Union and uh, make us an independent nation once more. Mm. Let's conclude with two questions on rather different topics. Let's assume for a second that Brexit goes as you um, hope it does and that that the aim has been achieved. Um, What does Mark Reckless want to achieve (coughs) 
over the coming years as an Assembly member? What, what will drive you forward next? And secondly, what does Mark Reckless do away from politics? What, what do you do when you want to zone out of the debates? Play with my kids. I've got three, uh, three, three children, uh, age six and, and under, and they take up an awful lot of time for me and my uh, wife. And uh, if you ask me about my, my interests or my, my, my hobbies, I, I actually... You know, it's fairly all-consuming being a being a parent of uh, of three of that of of, of, of that that age. But Are any so showing signs that at about age five or six they're going to think of being an MP? Don't know about that. <laughs> they're, so they're showing uh, a lot of a lot, a lot, a lot of lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, following uh, politics and the wider uh, wider w w world. Um, but um, I, I, don't, I don't know that. And also. I, I, you know when, when my memories of when, when I first thought I might want to be an MP, <laughs> it, it's very difficult to sort of remember when memories start. Memories Absolutely. are very easy to trick you in that. In and and what about policy? What do you want to drive forward? Well, now? one area I, I, I'm sort of w w work, working on a, a lot at the moment is the economic opportunities for us in uh, South East Wales and, and nowhere more than here in Newport, where we're recording this um, this interview, and. In terms of the Secretary of State, one, one area I, I'd like to give a lot of credit to the Secretary of State is for what he's doing to try and boost that economic development, most notably by, by scrapping the seven tolls, which is something I've uh, campaigned for and uh, made a very major part of the, the, the UKIP sort of platform, but have carried on uh, pushing within the Conservative group. And I was delighted when uh, Alan Cairns managed to uh, achieve that. I uh, really look forward to those tolls going. I hope that the Labour government in... Cardiff will uh, approve the uh, M4 r relief route, like the the, the, the Black Route, and I hope we, we get go ahead and, and get that get that moving. Um, electrification of the trains and uh, so Crossrail into into Paddington as as well makes uh, economic centres in, in London a lot more accessible, and I hope also in, in in Bristol. And frankly, we want to be looking at how Newport integrates into that economy, not just looking at the Cardiff uh, city region, important as that is for, for Cardiff, and also for improving opportunities in the valleys. But Newport is you know, between Cardiff and between Bristol, the two cities, and you know, particularly Bristol, who've been performing economically very strongly indeed, and we need to be thinking, how can we benefit from that? And I think we have to support development, and at the moment, the the biggest area of development is house building around Newport to an extraordinary d degree. And that's because the, the housing stock in Newport is relatively cheap compared to, uh, to Cardiff, but very much compared to, to Bristol. And there is an opportunity for lots of people from those uh, c cities working in those cities to come and base themselves in and around Newport. And I think that is an opportunity we should grab with both hands. We should welcome those people. We should recognise they will then put down roots root, root, roots here, uh, in many cases found their own, own businesses. And in due course, that will improve employment in Newport as well as the income and money being spent from people who are coming from outside. And I just think we need to see the UK government and the Welsh government government local councils elected mayors where they are in the west of england work as closely as possible together to ensure that as a as a sort of wider economic region we benefit from those opportunities and we drive up employment levels and income and opportunities for people in newport and the wider south wales east thank you very much mark reckless um we're going to play out with a song which I believe is from your, quote, clubbing days. <laughs> we will say no more.